Welcome to Financial Flight Academy with John Schutz and Brent Connolly from Soar Wealth Strategies. In this podcast, we inspire families and business owners to build a foundation for their financial future. We do this by listening and building trust with our clients. Join us for this journey where we explore ways to protect your nest and live out your dreams as John and Brent draw from years of experience and guest experts to help you take that leap of faith. You know how show hosts always start by saying you won't want to miss this show? Today, I'm not making any any guarantees, but today we welcome a dear friend of mine. He's an award-winning sportscaster, a business owner, a husband and father. He's also a font of useless knowledge. I'm John Schutz. (laughs) And I'm Brent Connolly. We want to welcome Jeff Grayson to Financial Flight Academy. Jeff, how are you? I'm great. Thank you, gentlemen. How are you too? This is going to be fun. Oh, this is going to be a blast. I'll be the judge (laughs) of that. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Let's start us right off, Jeff, here. How did you meet the one and only John Schutz? In the summer of 1990, I had just gotten my very first real job, so-called real job, my first career job. I was going to be on my own, and I was uh, hired as a sports reporter, photographer, anchor, and uh, fill-in hall monitor at WBAY (laughs) in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It did used to be a school, by the way. It did. It did used to be a school. (laughs) The building was a school. It's still there. And after... and. John was hired almost the same time. We were just a few weeks apart as the weekend anchor. And so we met that summer uh, in the sports department. And here we were, even though I'm from Wisconsin, I was new to Green Bay. Mm -hmm. I had lived in Green Bay before, but we were new to the jobs that we were in. John had come from Sioux Falls and uh, it already had much uh, better career started than I did, where I was kind of starting more as the number three guy. And we became uh, good friends from the get-go working in the sports department. Uh, the highlight covering the Packers, but also high school sports, all 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 the things. Ice fishing, ice, ice fishing, fishing. <laughs> yes, ice fishing. The, the opening day of deer hunting season, yeah, which was like the Super Bowl in Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, the outdoors, the outdoor stories that I had never covered. Being a, a city boy, we would go out on the frozen lakes and all that stuff. And then the next day, you might cover a, a, an NFL game. So we worked together as sportscasters and. Uh, it is the most fun, most fun I've ever had professionally in my career was working with John. I, oh, I would, uh, I would agree with that. Uh, that did you pay him to say that, John? <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. I would agree with that. We just, I, for some reason, I feel like we had the same childhood growing up, even mm-hmm. though we were hundreds of miles apart as we were doing it. So you were a young guy when we were up there, Jeff. Well, so was I <laughs> comparatively. Yes, you were now. too. Uh, yeah, but uh, what were some of the most important things you learned from your time there at WBAY? I've got a few that I, I'd like to reminisce about, but what what do you think? It was your first real job in the industry. Mm-hmm. I had worked behind the scenes in Milwaukee when I was in college and right after college, basically starting as a glorified gopher, no offense to Fred Grandy. And, um, and then I... Uh, <laughs> He was I, gopher on the love boat, by the way, yes. and later a congressman. <laughs> yeah, there are going to be a lot of disclaimers or corrections <laughs> and notifications to your audience. But um, <laughs> yes, he was, a con- he was a congressman. Absolutely. So come on. And he was, as, he was, was, as was Cooter from the Dukes of Hazzard. <laughs> oh, but that's anyway. right. Oh, I yep. love Ben Johnson. Show. But go, go ahead. That's Continue. right. That's right. Well, so I had worked behind the scenes before, and I you know, I'd gotten a resume tape back when there was t- – tape together. But when when working at WBAY, I learned right away that we didn't have a big sports department. We were fortunate. We had four people. We had our main anchor, Tim Hunt at the time, and we had uh, shooters. I call him John Schutz is the weekend anchor. I was the reporter and fill-in anchor. And then we had Carrie Clancy, who was our uh, producer who helped organize stories. There were four of us. But when we really were more like eight of us, because all of us were also videographers. We all had to shoot in a smaller market. Mm-hmm. And and then there were a lot of times we'd be alone in the sports farmer. Like sometimes John would be alone for most of the day. So he yeah. was writing scripts. He was cutting videotape. And that was the case for me too. You were often on your own and you might go out in the morning and shoot your own story, come back to the station, put it together, get it out of the way for your sports cast, and then concentrate on the things that probably most viewers think of, which is the games and highlights and things like that. But that wasn't good enough. You had to go out into the community and shoot and edit and write 
local features. And so I learned from all that really how to juggle a lot of things at the same time. Mm -hmm. And also every day, which I found exhilarating, and at, at times there was pressure, but I really found it exhilarating, was the immediate deadlines every day. Right. You, you had to put that work on the air. There was no, you know, let's table this discussion, Frank, until we get the numbers in for <laughs> next week's data. No, <laughs> like every day, every day, your work for better or worse, hopefully it was for better. Your work is on display every day. And then the next right. day you start all over. It's like those slates we had when we were kids. You draw the picture and then you start all over <laughs> I, again. <laughs> I, I will say this, Jeff, I have an appreciation for what goes on behind the scenes, just learning from John in his past life. And I give him a hard time that I grew up watching him on TV, which I did. <laughs> and, um, you know, because he was a staple in the house, right? You watch Absolutely. The and there's John shoots at the orange bowl or whatnot, but from what he's educated me on about the things that he had to do on his own behind the scenes and the mm -hmm. gruel, the grueling time out there on the road, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, there, it takes a, it takes a lot to put together a small, a small clip there for, you know, the news or what, whatever. And, segment the, and then the do. weatherman goes long and they say, yeah. hey, where can you cut a minute? <laughs> yeah. uh, there it is. I had okay. two and a half to start. What do you, yep. I just got here. Yeah. But uh, no, so Jeff, I'll tell you one of the things that I guess I got the most out of when we were in green Bay, other than our fantastic relationship, and it was and is to this day, even though we probably haven't seen each other in 10 years. Yes. Uh, but when we were in Green Bay, we had a very selfless sports director named Bill Jarts. And at, at one point in our careers, we had to we had the uh, Packer coaches show on before a show that we had to do to lead into Monday Night Football. And Bill Jarts, who was a big deal in Green Bay. Uh, mm -hmm. said is. to said to you and me, you know, this is the guy who could have just made the, it the Bill Jarts show, mm -hmm. but he said we got to make this thing different. Can't mm -hmm. be like the coaches show. You guys come up with something, mm -hmm. and yep. we just said, all right, why don't we do something like Saturday Night Live? We do a fake commercial in there, allowed us mm -hmm. to wear wigs and mm -hmm. <laughs> be wise guys with the back of <laughs> football players. Yep, and uh, but for. It goes back to the old Reagan quote, which I think he stole from somebody else, which is it's it's amazing what you can accomplish when you don't worry about who gets yeah. the credit. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, that yeah. that's true. I remember he said to I remember he said, this is Bill, not not President Reagan, who, by the way, my I have letters from President Reagan before he was president. My dad had correspondences with Ronald Reagan. He did some <laughs> business with him when he hosted GE Theater and after. And so I have wow. coincidentally, uh, President Reagan was a huge believer in the written word, writing letters. He loved to write letters. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, I uh, I remember Bill Jart saying that you guys look through the world with your own set of glasses. Keep doing that. If if you look good, I look good as a result. Keep doing your thing because I can't do what you guys do. And so we were kind of known for our rapport, our, I like to think our comedic timing, and from just working with John, yes. if you want to, oh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to isolate it for a second <laughs> to the two of us, and not even involve Bill, who is fantastic. What I always loved about John and I, we would work together, and people kind of got used to how we were together. Is when John and I worked together, I never cared when we did these skits who got more of the airtime. Right. I never cared about that. And our backgrounds were a little bit different in that we would we would do these um, skits, basically. I can't believe we were allowed to do these, but we were. And people looked forward to them. It was originally on a pregame show, Brent. We had a thing called the Board of Predictors. And okay. all the main anchors and the weather guy, they would all, you give your picks of all the games. You would just do the Packer pick on camera. And then they would, and it, it apparently had been going for 20 years and we kept doing it. And people, people loved it. And so we got together the first time we ever did one of these. And we thought, you know, we should just do one together. And so we did this one together and um, <laughs> we took it from there and uh, they got more involved and they kind of got more SCTV-ish. 
And as I started doing these, I realized really quickly, neither of us cared about who played who or who got more of the lines or anything. John Mm -hmm. has a great dramatic background and was really good at staging things. Oh, he's dramatic. All right. He's right. (laughs) I have no idea about that stuff. I just don't see the things that way where I was probably more of a, I think I wrote Oh, you I wrote, it, yeah, you I, wrote a I, ton I, of those things, came up with I, the concepts, I, I, although I will take yep. credit for all-star senior professional wrestling. Yes, that was a great one. <laughs> all-star senior professional wrestling. That was great. Oh, yeah. Walking goodness. in with shorts and the black dress socks up to our knees was, uh, that was. And a gray that, wig. And a gray wig. <laughs> but we, we had, we, we didn't have any any hesitation about okay i want to get i'm going to get the most credit for this one we we complimented each other really well and it was all about not who got the credit going back to what john said earlier so i would say as far as what i learned from that job some of it may sound cliche but you were working you were, while well, you were working as a team when there was a big story like when the packers signed reggie white to the shock of wisconsin the nfl <laughs> and the entire sports world right we went live. I don't know if you, you probably remember this well. I remember that day like it was yesterday. Brent, this was the biggest deal in the NFL at that time. Reggie White was the first big NFL free agent. NFL okay. didn't have true free agency like baseball did at that time. Okay. Reggie was the first big catch, if you will. And everybody was Every, t- saying he's going to Philly. He's going to New York. He's staying in Philly. He's yep. going to Los Angeles. Yep. Yeah. At he, that came, time, he came from Philly, right? Yeah, it came from right. Philly, okay. and they couldn't reach a contract, so Reggie was a free agent. At the time that this happened, it was we had heard it was either it was going to be San Francisco because they had the Joe Montana, mm-hmm. Bill Walsh machine at that time. They were kind of the preeminent juggernaut. It was just before Dallas took off with Jimmy Johnson. We had heard it was going to be San Francisco, Washington, Cleveland had an outside shot because Reggie's mm-hmm. wife is from Ohio, I believe. Nobody thought the Packers where it, all of a sudden it comes over four words on the wire copy and it says Packers signed Reggie White and we had been staking this thing out for a long well, time but we Jeff you forget we, we broke that we story broke yeah that story was, that the, the yeah. WBY says Packers signed Reggie so we we just went into all <laughs> scale mode and it was like you, you two get to Lambo. You do this. You do this. Remember Bill Jarts? They we interrupt one life to live for this report. <laughs> 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 and it it was massive. The entire state of Wisconsin, all the markets. That's Leclaire, uh, Lacrosse, Eau Claire, Wausau, Green Bay, Madison, and Milwaukee, all went live when this happened at night. And this was the great thing. There wasn't like a week before Reggie came in. Reggie came in that night. Remember, they yep. brought him in with Ron awesome. Wolf, the general manager, who's in the Hall of Fame now, Bob Harlan, the president, and Mike Holmgren, who had was starting his second year as coach and is, by the way, on the ballot for the Hall of Fame now. They brought them in to Green Bay to the Packers headquarters at about 7 o'clock that night. The whole state went live. And yes, we broke that. And we all, no one cared about who got the credit. We all just, it was sure. an amazing story. Everybody cared about it. It was exhilarating, but that was teamwork. But then when you were on your own in the sports department, you learned that you were responsible for wearing so many hats, even mm-hmm. literally running the scores to the control room, tearing all the carbon <laughs> copy true. scripts. You had to tear the carbon. I got to run these scripts. Okay. Director gets this copy. Producer gets this copy. Graphics gets this copy. I get these. Boop, 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 boop. And then you've still got to write all the content, record the games, pick the highlights and do the features in the community. And mm-hmm. while it sounds Sounds like a lot. Obviously, the more you do it, you get it down. But you realize this is on me. And when you have a team to work with, it was like stealing. That when you didn't have to do it all alone, but it was all on you. And while it was pressure, it was really just amazing, adrenaline and exhilarating. And you're working with good people who who didn't care about who got the credit. And that's right. that was amazing because that's not the case in every station or in every job, obviously in the American workplace. But it, it was. It was just, it was just amazing. And then you, and you know what I learned from, from that Reggie white thing. You remember how beforehand we were calling around to other TV stations and he's going here, he's going Mm -hmm. there. No, he's Mm -hmm. staying in Philly. Uh, Mm -hmm. You, uh, that's when I first realized that some of these reports you hear in television, whether it's news or sports, it's just people talking to other people. They don't really know. Right. That's right. 
And uh, mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of that in our industry, Brent. Yeah. Where oh. It's, uh, you know, a lot of fear and mm-hmm. fear selling mm-hmm. of various mm-hmm. products. We don't sure. have to go into those and make my vein in my neck stick yeah. out. But. Instead of wa- water cooler talk, now it's internet talk. Well, I saw That's that. Right. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so Jeff, now now you're a Wisconsin guy. You you grew up in Wisconsin. Is that right? Yes. Where, where are you I grew up from? there. I'm from a Milwaukee suburb, an inner ring suburb called Wauwatosa, which is about 15 minutes from downtown Milwaukee. Just a okay. nice community. It was a great place to grow up. Uh, hey, hey, know. Brent, ask him how he broke up the Beatles. Go ahead. No, <laughs> ask him. No. Brent, ask him. Uh, okay, Jeff, how ask did him. you break up the Beatles? How did I break up the Beatles? It's like what? breaking up the Beatles. He left. He left oh, Green Bay. Oh, okay. <laughs> you jumped ahead. You oh, jumped yeah. ahead. No. You ju- you're already jumping ahead to the breakup. Well, I would have yeah. stayed if I. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I grew up in. I grew up in. <laughs> I'm tired of being an Everly brother. I remember shouting that across <laughs> when the Everly when we stopped working. We used to shout out when the Everly brothers had a big feud in the late. They had enough. And one brother said on stage, I'm tired of being an Everly brother. We would <laughs> shout that at each other just as a joke when and people got so used to it. But by yeah, the way, they're up, from Sh- they're from Shenandoah, Iowa, very nearby. Oh, anyway, go ahead. Continue. Everly brothers. Yeah. Grew up grew up in a suburb of Milwaukee, just grew up there. And then I, mm-hmm. I went to college at UW Milwaukee. Okay. And then uh my whole goal, I honestly, growing up was either to be Johnny Carson or uh a sportscaster in Milwaukee, and then as uh, as you get into the business, you realize you got to go to smaller markets. And I was fortunate that I got to go to Green Bay for my first main on-air job, which is like market 70. And they have an NFL team, very much an anomaly, as you know, in sports. So, yes, I was a Wisconsinite for the first 28 years of my life. And ever since I live in Minnesota, but I'm very proud of my Wisconsin roots. Well, after this, we are going to find out about some of your roots and just how freaky Jeff's mind works. In a minute. Excuse me. Yeah, you. Thanks so much for listening to Financial Flight Academy. We hope you're enjoying it so far. If you have any questions or would like to talk more about this topic, you can find us at SoarWealthStrategies.com. And all of our social media platforms are listed in the show notes. And we're back at Financial Flight Academy with our guest, Jeff Grayson. So, Jeff, tell us a little bit about how you got interested in sports. I understand your uh, your father was in advertising but had an opportunity to meet uh, some famous athletes. Yep, that's right. Uh, when when my dad grew up, he, he had a passion for sports himself. And he was actually ahead of his time. He would have been a great guest for you guys if we could go in a time machine because my my dad was really big on sports marketing before that was really a big deal even going back to when Arnold Palmer first hit it big before I was around and so my dad was was an advertising executive and we are so lucky he was he uh, he went to Northwestern wanted to be a sports writer or a sportscaster and one day he was covering something and someone said to him Herb you'll have more fun as a fan And my dad agreed with that, and he put the sports writing away and went over to the business side and became uh, an advertising and public relations man. And uh, by the time little Jeffy came on the scene, he was in an agency in Milwaukee. (laughs) And uh, he went to Northwestern Medill School of Journalism, you know, a great school. And um, he, through his work with clients, mainly McDonald's, but he had other clients like Canada Dry and Amity Leather, who made wallets, Speed Queen, um west bend those clients he would get tickets to the games from the teams because my dad was passionate about sponsorship of games back then he just was a big believer on the power of sports when a lot of games weren't televised and so he would be thinking about this nil stuff going on now yeah i don't know i I don't know what he'd think with all the games being on tv because the cherished part of my childhood was having the transistor because most of the games weren't on and Mm -hmm. so my dad would get these tickets from for the Brewers and the Bucks for free, by the way, we we paid for the Packer tickets for season ticket holders. But for the Brewers and the Bucks, he would take us to the games. And sometimes when they do commercials, he would take us on shoots, not John shoots, but commercial shoots. He would take you us. Wish. Sometimes he'd take us to the athletes' homes. I remember being at Raleigh Fingers condo, <laughs> watching Raleigh <laughs> Fingers Raleigh Fingers do a commercial, and. Uh, I hope he won't Did you mind. help him wax his mustache? He had the famous <laughs> handlebar mustache. <laughs> yes, that's right. First great relief pitcher of all time. And I remember uh-huh. they were in a break and he went over. He said, hey, come here. 
I said, yeah. He goes, you want an autograph? I said, sure. I mean, this is unbelievable. He goes, yeah, open that cabinet. And like 3,000 cards of Raleigh's fingers <laughs> fell out. <laughs> wow. you know, it's a little little jaded, you know, to see all of them. Yeah, take one. It's like, okay, thanks. But um, I, I The world yeah. wants to know, Jeff, did yeah. you steal food off the plate of a Hall of Fame baseball player? <laughs> I didn't steal it, but I asked him if he was going to eat it, and he said no, and so I took it. Yes, that's Don <laughs> Sutton, who is in the Hall of Fame. That was, this is okay. So my dad was did a lot of work with the Brewers. Don Sutton. As soon as Don Sutton got traded from your Houston Astros, by the way, he got traded yes. from the Astros to the Brewers, who were pursuing a pennant in 1982, and it turned mm-hmm. out that they wouldn't have won it without Don Sutton. He was the perfect late season acquisition, a veteran pitcher. He was perfect. And the second that Don Sutton came to the Brewers he had this reputation for being great on television with advertisers and my dad said we are going to get Don Sutton for our products we're going to get him for McDonald's we're going to get him for this we're going to get him doing car dealerships the whole thing and so he basically in a business sense pursued Don and one time we were going to a Bucks game and my dad said and I was starving he said we're leaving early and I was starving I'm like 17 I got a metabolism like a rabbit and I was like let's (laughs) go so we go down so we skip dinner at home. We go down to the Bucks game. He said, no, we're not going to the Bucks game right away. We're going to this restaurant. We're going to meet with Don Sutton. I've got to talk a little bit of business with him. Then we'll go to the game. So again, I'm starving. They talk business. He was super nice. Couldn't have been nicer. I'm sitting here with a future Hall of Fame pitcher, just the three of us. And, and the food comes and it's just not enough for me. And I am, like I said, I'm just this starving, stupid, (laughs) awkward 17 year old kid. And he's barely touching his food because he and my dad are eating are talking business and not knowing any better. Apparently I leaned over to him and said, excuse me, Mr. Sutton, are you going to eat those fries? And so that's great. (laughs) He said, no, he said, no, take them. He pushed the plate towards me and my dad got so Red with rage <laughs> and embarrassment. <laughs> and so we fit, we had the rest of the meal. And Don Sutton and I actually just for kicks called a, a fake at bat because he of a at a, he we pretended we were on the air together. He said, This is Don Sutton at Dodger Stadium. And we used like the A1 steak sauce bottle as a microphone and after it was over and it was time for us to go to the Bucks game, we were getting up and my dad said, Jeffrey, don't you ever do that again where you ask somebody I'm sitting with if they're going to eat their food or not. Don't ever do that again. I'm but pretty I got, sure he did it to me, but that's all right. Yeah, that's, that's okay. <laughs> so, so I got, I was used to being around these, these, these mm-hmm. athletes and seeing the process. And I loved being at the stadium at the ballpark, even when it was empty and watching it fill up. I loved it. And I was, I'm a total klutz. I knew I wasn't going to be an athlete, but I loved playing sports and I loved writing about it. And I loved the, I was fascinated by TV from the get go. And so when you mix that in with my dad's background and what he exposed us to, it just, I knew from the time I was four or five years old, I want to do something with sports. I want to, I mean, we would play kickball at recess. I would make my hand into a fist and I'd go up to the kid who had just kicked a home run. I'd say, Steve, you know, Steve, what happened when you kicked that ball over Mrs. Harmon's room? You know, we're like seven years the, old. The funny thing about it, Jeff, is if we had actually done the math on actually getting a job in television mm-hmm. at the time, you had three mm-hmm. TV stations in a market. You have maybe two yep. sports jobs in most markets. Mm-hmm. We were lucky mm-hmm. there were four. Yeah. You know, the math just didn't work out. There's only like 1,500 jobs, maybe. Right. And uh, mm-hmm. But it, it, it brings to mind a quote I heard uh, this past week. From Will Godara, he's the author of Unreasonable Hospitality, and his father used to give him, he gave him a note one time that said, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? And I think Uh, that's just great. That's great. Great advice to anybody. I'm going to give that to my grandkids. You know, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? Wow. So. Good I advice, I think. That's great advice. It's great advice. Well, and I, you now have you sent your oldest child off to college. Just yes. How, how's that She's working a, out for you? <laughs> well, <laughs> She's uh 
She's a freshman. We just got uh, the second bill already. Uh, we uh, we were waiting <laughs> for this. One. Yeah, thank you. We were waiting for this one scholarship to go through that she had earned from her high school's foundation. We're very proud she got this scholarship. In the scheme of things, it's not going to do much more than buy her a textbook. But we had thought that <laughs> we had thought that the money had gone through, that the foundation had sent the college the the money, and we immediately got a letter, an email last week. A, letter an email saying you owe us five hundred dollars pronto and we thought oh my gosh they're they're not messing around it turns out there was a snafu of course but yeah it's uh it's i'm doing okay uh, it's expensive I'm it's expensive okay, but yeah I'm coming to grips i'm coming to grips with that part yes well we, the, t- we talk a lot this is where we talk about our business here jeff's so just pipe down for a minute uh so we <laughs> brent and i talk a lot about preparing for the cost of college. <laughs> we do but, though, right? College is very important for a lot of folks to yeah, send their absolutely. kids off. And, mm-hmm. um, you, you know, there's a little sticker shock nowadays. You know, there's yeah. some studies by Fidelity that say college can now be over $1,000. Well, so, yeah. So, well, yeah. And the, the thing about that is people prepare for the cost of college, but there's an even greater expense coming everybody's way in retirement. And that's the cost of healthcare. And Fidelity mm-hmm. also did a, they did a study on uh, healthcare and that, retirees over the age of 65 are going to spend over $300,000 in healthcare during their retirement. Yeah, so it's crazy. We help folks plan for those costs, don't we, Brent? Mm-hmm. We do. Absolutely. It's it's part of our, you know, comprehensive planning purpose, you know. We talk about health savings accounts a lot with our clients mm-hmm. to help, you know, start to factor in uh, saving now mm-hmm. for those future, you know, medical healthcare costs that they're going to mm-hmm. have. Are you using those in the most efficient way, maybe? And then what are your Medicare options? That doesn't even include the potential cost of a long-term care stay. So do you have a strategy for those things? And if you need help in those areas, give us a call here at Sorewell Strategies. What's that number, Brent? Oh, it's really easy to remember. It's 531-867-3400. Or visit us on the website. John, what's that website? It's SorewellStrategies.com, Brent. Thank you very much. Okay, Thank you. back to Jeff Grayson here. Uh, Jeff, I have mentioned that you have some freaky talents. Are you ready to uh, <laughs> audition for the circus or the carnival <laughs> right now? I, I will give it a shot with only this disclaimer, Brent, that a lot of it comes from a strange mind that apparently okay. had too much time on his hands. One of the first ways I learned to read was TV Guide. That is the truth. We would get TV Guide delivered okay. on Thursdays. So I we're read gonna, TV we're... Guide every week religiously from about age five or six. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. That's the truth. That's disturbing. But <laughs> now, so I, I, I've i spent a lot of time, Jeff, trying to uh, figure out where do we even begin <laughs> on this describing how strangely your brain works. But so you have this ability to, you can take any date and know what day of the week it is. It was, right? Is that correct? Can I? Well, you've yeah. told me that now. Wait, well, okay. So this may not work out very well, folks. Yeah. You might put me on the spot. Maybe so, okay. Well, what day of the week was July 4th, 19, 1976, July 4th, oh, 1976. I don't know. You're, you're having me I, mixed up with somebody. I, no, I that's not true. July 4th, 1976. I, uh, it was the bicentennial. Well, yeah, it was the bicentennial. I know that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So man, it was, they used to have the bicentennial minutes. Every apparently you day cheated. CBS. You, All right. You cheated on those dates. Is it apparently. Tuesday? Okay. Well, was it, a, was it a Tuesday? No, it's not even close. I thought you oh. had this skill. Okay. So maybe you're no, not as you, freaky as I I can thought. tell you that Conrad Bain played Mr. Drummond on different strokes and he, he, <laughs> Who he, can't? he played the neighbor on Maud. <laughs> okay. So let's go. Okay. Maud, All right. You're not going to make this neighbor. You're not going to make this. Who is Maude's neighbor? Well, Conrad Bain. He was married oh, to gotcha. I'm sorry. All right. I'm All right. Just back it down a notch. All right. So let's let's audition. Uh, you're not going to make the State Fair midway, but let's let's move on to the TV <laughs> Guide trivia. OK. Uh, and I do share a little bit of this trait, sadly. But yes, Jeff, you do. Uh, you, you can tell you names of actors who've played some pretty obscure parts in television. So, oh, boy, here we go, Jeff. Oh, this is, pressure. You'll, you'll, this you're is more pressure it. than our This career, one's going to be Brent. easy. This one's going to be easy. From the Dick Van Dyke show. Yes. Okay. okay. Who was the actor that portrayed the neighbor, Dr. Jerry Helper? Oh, Jerry Paris, who later became a director of Happy Days episode. Jerry Paris. Yeah. <laughs> see, he, wow. see, Brent, Okay. He, he doesn't just tell you the name. He knows some of their family history. 
Okay. Yeah. Let, right. Go I'll, ahead, I'll, I'll fire Give one at you, Jeff. Okay. He was a dentist on that show. Yes, thank you. Who mm-hmm. played the role of Sam the Butcher? Alan the Melvin. Jeez. <laughs> okay. <laughs> From the Brady Bunch. Okay. Also, in a lot of cartoons, him? he was also on All in the Family. He was. Okay. He always played. He was on uh, the was he, Bill was he show, s- the Phil Silver show. Alan yeah. Melvin. Yep. Yeah. He also Very played a, uh, a tough guy on the Andy Griffith show. He did. Not, you yes. took the word. See, that's where we're, it's scary. I was about to say. He was, every now and then, the Andy Griffith show would have a naughty guy because he was a sheriff. <laughs> well, he was a sheriff. Yes. He yeah, he was a sheriff. <laughs> every now and then, especially in the early ones, you know, probably before, you know, Howard Sprague came on the scene. <laughs> played who, who by played? Jack Dodson. <laughs> I Why it. I know this, I don't know. Yeah, that's All right. a little odd. But, uh, but I settled a lot of bar bets in Green Bay because there I, were a lot of because there were a lot of bars. That's true. That is true. <laughs> All right, uh, we just lost Suzanne Summers recently from Three's Company. Yeah, but that's too easy. But by, by the way, I checked into a hotel once with Suzanne Summers. So that makes it sound really interesting, but she was actually in front of me with her husband when she checked in, and then I checked in. That was in wow. Tampa. That was in Tampa. I was covering a Packer game. She became yeah. quite the you know honestly, she became quite the entrepreneur in the last half of her life. Almost, she was much more uh, her career. The money she made was much more for that than if you think about it. She wasn't in that many shows. And that, that's that, the reason that, she was in Tampa because the Home Shopping Network uh, is in, uh, was in Tampa. She ah, was a pioneer there. Had the there you go. Day. All right. So from Three's Company, I don't, I don't want to know about Suzanne Summers' character, yep. whose name was Chrissy Snow. There you go. Jack's friend was Larry Dallas. That was his character name. And his, who portrayed his name, Larry in Three's Richard, Company? Cl- Richard Klein. And I didn't know his last name was Dallas. You just taught me something. His name was Richard I had, Klein, John. I had to look up Larry Dallas, but uh, wow. see, I can't wait to get everybody on our website sending in ra- random actors and roles <laughs> here. Okay, uh, he'll know. Be- I'll make this quick, real quick. I've okay. done some me. I've done some media training with the military, which is probably scary. Where the the military trains with scenarios. And uh, a good friend of mine would lead these groups that we basically would portray a fictional cable news network covering the scenario. Mm -hmm. And after a break where we were just kicking back, we had some spare time and someone heard me talking about an old TV show. And then someone asked me who played who, and they started trying to stump me. This is the truth. (laughs) We had some former FBI guys on this because they bring in people from all different fields to help with the scenario. And this man who was a lifetime guy in the FBI comes in. He goes, FBI, who's the main guy? That's like Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. Yeah, he goes, absolutely. He goes, who was the next guy? I said, Philip Abbott. <laughs> he goes, oh, he got Philip Abbott. Come on in here. And this is the truth. For 20 minutes, they were lined up outside like I was a carnival act <laughs> to, the, to the point to the point where the boss said, all right, all right, break it, <laughs> break it up. But I and I kept the FBI uh, kept going around. He said he got Philip Abbott. He got Philip Abbott. Well, Jeff, we we it's we kind of got to wrap this up, but we haven't yeah. even talked about what you're doing now. So tell us a little bit about Keller Grayson, what you do now, which has sure. kind of gone uh, full circle for you because you worked at has. McDonald's as a kid. I worked at McDonald's as a kid, and my dad uh, ran the advertising account. Also, I they're a big client of ours here in Minnesota and Western Wisconsin. What does we Keller Grayson at, do? Yes, yep, we do communications and public relations, uh, media training, uh, media writing. I think I think the thing that really ties in best to the careers John and I had before was working with the media. But we also do a lot of work. The most rewarding part of the job is doing work with the Ronald McDonald House uh, mm-hmm. to help families promote that cause. And then we also do things like prom- we do promotions, uh, planning big events like employee events, things like that. But uh, the heart of it is public relations. Yes. Have you ever gotten over the fact that Ronald McDonald stole your shoes? <laughs> you know i i haven't i haven't and don't even get me started on the grimace <laughs> jeff it's been fun for me brent i told you you probably weren't going to get a word in edgewise here today yeah. so well jeff it these so wrap it awesome. up for us <laughs> well thank you jeff the stories are great really we could send spend all day long hearing about this trivia but thanks so much for joining we appreciate it as, as always, check us out at SoarWealthStrategies.com, 
feel free to give us a call, 531-867-3400. Make sure that you find our podcast on all the major platforms, and we'll see you next time on Financial Flight Academy. Thank you for listening to the Financial Flight Academy podcast. Click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. Visit our website at SoarWealthStrategies.com or give us a call at 531-867-3400. And don't forget to click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Soar Wealth Strategies. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified qualified financial service providers with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Securities and advisory services offered through Commonwealth Financial Network, member FINRA SIPC, a registered investment advisor.